Try to get it up there. No, your energy is already there. I'm like tired. All right. I'm like, let me let me get stoked. <laughs> if that's not okay, involved, yeah. If that's not involved in your branding somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I just grew up hearing that too much. There's so many jokes about it, but touche, touche. Yeah. Okay, the people they're excited. They're excited. I hope so. I'm excited. Let me fix, fix this lighting situation. Okay, that's better. All right. You think so? What do we? What do we? Is it? Okay, I, don't well, I don't know. I don't. Know I think I liked things. it better before. You had a little bit more. Oh, I see what you're saying. But no, that's good. Okay. That's good. Okay, that's good. All right. I'm just letting. I'm letting people come in. You know, people they stroll in like it's church. So okay. they're coming in. They're coming in. Hey guys. Hey guys. Hey guys. Hey guys. Hey guys. Um. Hold on one second. Let me add it. Right, me, you, you know, I actually made notes for the first time. Isn't that crazy? I don't know why you made notes. I made notes on your video because I was like, he said this is a fucking primer. So I better be fucking primed. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I talk fast. So on those. Fair. Fair. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to let it get to. Let's see. I'll give y'all about. One more minute, and then we're going to officially, tishly start. And uh, the topic of discussion this evening is how the fuck do we level up? And um, the reason for this is because you did a video where you essentially were like, y'all, we think we're doing something right now. And this is just real basic tip of the iceberg shit. And there needs to be a lot more to this. And then it's like, it's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I know, but like what? And then I said, let me, let me just ask him. <laughs> and you were like, yeah. yeah, I'll come through. So um, for those of you all who are just joining us, it is me and Greg Stoker. And um, do you like the J said every time? No, I just do it because Greg Stoker was already taken. So either I have to fight that guy and destroy him or put the J in there. <laughs> I don't think you really understand what I mean when I say you would have been my friend in seventh grade. Like there was a certain okay. brand of white boy that I was friends with mm. in seventh grade. And to this day, they're like, Amanda, what's up? I'm like, that's. <laughs> what's up? What's up, Amanda? <laughs> like they're in my DMs. They're like fucking free Palestine. I'm like, exactly, Brody. Exactly. Fucking free Palestine, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. You guys are in here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, First of all, Honestly, Greg, like you just kind of like came into my purview in the midst of, I think like the way that so many of us did, where there was a small number of people who weren't already Palestinian that were like, hold up, this shit is fucked up. And um, the algorithm in a twist of fate started sending, you know, those people to each other. And you were one of those people mm -hmm. where actually someone hit me, specifically someone hit me and was like, this is a white boy that knows what he's talking about. And I was like, I'd like to watch. Um, because I don't know if you know this, there's a whole brand of people that will only receive information because they've been brainwashed so much. They'll only receive information from white men. Oh, I know. Oh, okay. I totally know. You're using your powers for good. Got it. Okay. So, uh, so I was like, you know, yes, I look, I learned so much early on also because I'm a civilian, you know, and I think a lot of us really don't know anything about the way these militarized spaces work about, you know, the propaganda, even, even just the propaganda that tells us that the ID, that the IOF is a good military, right? Like, I, I mean, you're yeah. <laughs> so first and foremost, can you just tell us, um, how the fuck did you get so solid? How? I mean, it was a journey, uh, you know, didn't happen overnight. I, uh, let's see, I joined the military to basically not a unique story to escape like a bad 
uh, home environment and to like not be homeless because that would be awesome. So uh, I enlisted like the day after I, I got out of high school, um, no. went to special operations because I, I wanted to prove something to myself. And I went into the 75th Ranger Regiment, did four deployments there, started off as a fire team leader and then transitioned more into an intelligence role. And uh, that's kind of where I got exposed to um, what was actually really going on once, uh, you know, you had a certain security clearance. And that's when I was like, wow, uh, this is completely messed up and illegal. And that's kind of like, and also this war is not being fought in a way that's going to be won. I was never in Iraq. I was too young. So I was just in Afghanistan. Uh, and I, I got out after one contract. I uh, thought I was going to go full, uh, full on spook city after a, uh, you know, going in special operations, then I go work for the company, which is why I don't have any like tattoos because I was like really into that, uh, you know, the, the CIA stuff. And I was like, w just after that exposure, I couldn't in good conscience like stay in because uh, straight up war crimes were happening, not on the uh, the Vietnam scale, uh, which we're going to talk about, but uh, mm -hmm. still very re real and present from happening when I was in from Libya down to Yemen, up to northern Pakistan into afghanistan yeah so just all across like a significant portion of the earth it was act active active imperialism and then i uh, went to college uh was going to study uh political science uh to uh, do a civilian intelligence role and uh i transitioned into anthropology and then uh kind of got into post-colonial studies focusing on like the british raj and uh America's involved, uh, the British's involvement in, in that region of the world. And so that's kind of where the journey towards uh, divesting myself of these supremacist ideas that I had uh, been taught growing up. That's uh, what I was like, no, we're missing a step. I'm, I'm yeah. like, we're missing a step. I'm like, mm -hmm. because I, I, I was like, okay, but where did the switch happen? Because all the white boys that I know that are about it, about it, there was a switch that happened. There was something that, and the Zion, and the anti-Zionist that I know, like mm -hmm. there was like mm -hmm. a moment or an experience that was like, hold up now. And then it ended up, you know, kind of dovetailing. And I mean, I know you don't want to reveal your security clearance, but was it like when you experienced the thing that made you say, hey, this is crazy. Were you like a loner in that? Or were other people in your regimen also like, wow, this is too much? Um, uh, they didn't have the same exposure because I, I drifted more into the uh, intelligence side. So uh, I don't know. It, it basically came down to me uh, realizing like, okay, uh, I voted for this administration twice. Uh, and that's the Obama administration. And I'm like, holy shit. That entire cabal, the inner circle of Obama, Biden, Clinton, uh, they're all straight up war criminals, like no two ways about it. Um, and they're just exercising shameless imperialism like Libya, uh, the whole Gaddafi thing, lying to the American public about why that happened. You know, right. it, it certainly had nothing to do with transitioning off the dollar as a standard system, you know you know, why a coup happened in Libya. So it was just, it was just things like that. Uh, I always resent being lied to. It, that's another part of it. So. There's always a root. <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like anytime. Cause I know for me, that's, that's my, that's like a big part of my radicalism. I don't fucking like mm -hmm. being lied to. And then I have to be like hard, you know, hard line. Like, no, that's not cool. So. Mm -hmm. The video that brought us here was uh, you talking about the um, the Vietnam War as an example of well the act the activism against the Vietnam War as an example of like sophisticated efforts that were taken to really it, uh, undermine it. But I think to start like Greg, I don't know if you well you know this. I feel like most of us don't really know about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you kids know about Nam? All right. Well, we're going to talk about that. Um, so this is exactly what I wanted it to be. So I'm just tickled. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so basically what happened was in, in 1954, uh, the, Fr the French Indochina colonial project collapsed. The French pulled out of Vietnam. Uh, I'm condensing a really complicated history into like two minutes. Um, there was a North 
Vietnam and a South, kind of like a partition happened, right? Yeah. And North Vietnam was backed by Russian imperialism, Chinese interests, basically a communist bloc. And South Vietnam was a very corrupt government backed primarily by the United States. And there was a proxy war going on for 10 years uh, uh, before the U.S. actually put boots on it. So I'll be interjecting because sometimes you'll say things that I just want you to give a quick definition of for folks that are like just coming to this. What's a proxy okay. war? A proxy war. Um, so a proxy war is where two countries are fighting each other, but they're not fighting each other directly. So a good example of this um, would be uh, the uh, United States and Afghanistan fighting the Taliban that were sponsored by certain elements of the Pakistani intelligence services. So Pakistan was pushing their own political agenda by using a proxy, certain tribes within the Taliban to fight against us. Um, certain people believe that the U war in Ukraine is a CIA proxy war against Russia. I'm not part of that, where Ukraine is being used by, as a United States proxy to fight Russia. I don't really subscribe to that personally, but those are two examples of proxies being used to fight each other. Okay. So, that. so yeah. now, let's go. Yeah. Proxy, <laughs> so yeah. North Vietnam, South Vietnam, there was a proxy war where Russia was funding North Vietnam. Okay. The Viet Cong. The Viet Cong. Oh, yes. We and know yeah. Okay. So the Vietnam was a proxy. I mean, they were also fighting their, for their own like independence and stuff um, for, for, uh, communist interests and we framed it like south vietnam was fighting as our proxy to support de democratic interests but okay. of course the south vietnamese government was entirely corrupt so after 10 years of this proxy war uh for a lot of complicated reasons uh the united states gets involved and that's uh, and anti-war activism had existed throughout this like a lot of people knew that this was a proxy war uh, we were supporting them with like bombing campaigns and stuff, but boots didn't go on the ground, but that's when it really kicked off in 1964. Um, so what happened uh, and why this is significant, the Vietnam War is significant. It's the first time there was a mass uh, kind of an uprising against an, a war in American history because, uh, you know, there was World War II, Pearl Harbor happened. Nobody was arguing against that. Right. Then the Korean War happened, uh, very problematic. It was basically over a treaty and other special interest purposes, but we were still riding off the coattails of World War II, so we still thought we were unquestionably the good guys. Uh, but when Vietnam kicked off, the, the reasons for it were really murky. Um, a lot of people thought it was engineered. Uh, there was an incident in the Gulf of Tonkin where a U.S. ship got attacked by the North Vietnam, and that was the cause of war that gave us justification to go in a lot of people were like no that's bullshit and so what happened was the first organized attempt at act anti-war activism so the, the, there were two groups uh that really started the movement it was uh left leftists uh democratic leftists not liberals because like liberals will never never be on the the, the picket line leftists and okay, uh so radical real quick Real quick, give mm -hmm. us the difference between leftists and liberals. Because I feel like a lot of people only know about like right wing, moderate, liberal. What do we consider to be leftists? Um, okay. Left wing politics it basically describes a range of political identities that support to achieve social equality and a um and egalitarianism. Um as opposed to, you know, the more conservative. Uh, elements. So uh, when you when we say leftists, let me let me find. I'm really bad at definition uh, okay. definition. So <laughs> I'm good at I'm good uh, at this. Hold on. Okay. Leftist meaning <laughs> they're like a person with left wing political views. Yeah, I, I know. Mean, um, safe to say okay. that would we say that left? Okay. okay, go ahead. Here we go. Uh, here's the best one. I would say that. On a very bit, the simplest distinction between liberals and leftists is that liberals support capitalism and want to make changes within it, but leftists kind of see the entire thing as flawed. Uh, they stand up more for like workers' rights and see how predatory a capitalist system can be. So uh, they lean more towards socialism than uh, okay. 
to liberals. So uh, I'm kind of more of a leftist. So I think liberalism is actually a form of white supremacy and uh, maintaining the status quo. That's just my personal reason, belief. But the reason why that language is important is because, Greg, like right now, so many people are for the first time, like having to decide like where they fit in, mm -hmm. you know, and like what is the label that right. is closest to them in order to determine like where do they move and who do they move with? Um, mm -hmm. so therefore, so that y'all, because I know a lot of people are like, well, I'm not a liberal cause they'd be on some bullshit. Um, if mm -hmm. Kamala Harris is a liberal, I'm not a liberal, you know? So she's very, she's very liberal. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so that's the most basic definition. Um, okay. I, I would enc encourage people to, uh, read about that. Uh, but the second group that really started it, cause this was a grassroots, uh, kind of uprising. Second group was radicalized college students that witnessed the civil rights movement. Uh, that was still ongoing at the time because this was 64. Mm -hmm. uh, and they they just realized that uh, their fascist government could just turn a blind eye to any sort of injustice. When did Vietnam uh, start? 64. It did start in 64. Okay, so that- I mean, that so that's that's when U.S. boots were got put on the ground. So the um, activism against it was immediate? Pretty much. It, it had been building for a time, but when U.S. entered the war, it it sprang up. Uh, right. So, okay. I mean, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. There, there had been groups protesting against the proxy war, but when U.S. Yeah. the U.S. got involved, yeah. So, what they did uh, was they started, uh, you know, teaching on ca uh, college campuses, educating people about the Vietnamese, the war in Vietnam, the military-industrial complex that was birthed out of the Second World War, um, and basically all getting on the same page. Now, it's interesting because social media has pretty much done that. It's done that educating quicker. Uh, see, like everything's happen, everything's happening faster right now yes. than it did in Vietnam because of the interconnectedness of everything. Uh, uh -huh. So, so that was one of my foreign, questions. <laughs> yeah, like for, foreign policy and what's happening with, with like Israel as a colonial project and the expression of their violence would usually take fifty years, but everything like happening mind-bogglingly fast and that's why all these analysts these political commentators are just like i, I don't know like i don't freaking know either um because it's well, you, it's I unprecedented like you've, alluded, you've alluded to that some of it is happening so fast because they like are gonna lose or like they need to hurry up because there's like an impending um you know, kind of like there, there is an impending end to this that's going to that that they have to kind of like try and get as much bullshit in or as much terror in as possible until. But, I, you know, at this point, I'm just like, we're how many days into this? And it's like it's still I mean, I, I just saw a video this morning of. Um, just uh, all these different folks in the Knesset. Just expressing new levels of evil, I'm like. They got nothing on Senator. Like Senator Palpatine has nothing on these people. Like nothing. Yeah, it's, I mean they're they're, they're certainly what. Yeah, they're they're way more unhinged than Uncle Palps. But uh, like even 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 wow. their like le left wing centrist elements are are like, you know, um, <laughs> like so. Um, so it's moving. So okay. So it, if it's moving so rapidly. And our, because I know one of the things that you listed that they had to do in terms of like these two grassroots efforts of beginning to get folks riled up in terms of mm -hmm. activism was they'd educate everybody. And I would yeah. say that, I mean, social media, this is the first time I've ever seen social media be used for good. Like, <laughs> like yeah. and I've been on this shit since 08. Like, this is the first time I've ever seen people like actively saying, oh my God, I learned this. Let me share it. Like, let me... Like people DM me all the time, like, yeah, like I thought you were wrong. And then I learned from these other videos that like, no, this is true. So how do we feel that that quickness of education is helpful in our next step that they went to? Okay. Well, you have to uh, remember things are happening really fast, but and people are like, what the fuck? Like, what the hell? It's 135 days in. There's no noticeable changes. I mean, there are, but you have to remember, it took 10 years of relentless activism and protests and civil disobedience and straight up like riots and burning shit uh, for, you know, that to take effect. 10 years, 10 years. So that was the first stage. It was, it was the educating. 
The second phase was came in like two or three years in. Uh, that's where there was a concerted effort to merge different uh, activism fronts. Um, so that's like, you know, the leftists who are pushing for like socialism, uh, people from the civil rights movement, um, you know, environmentalists all like getting on the same page with stuff because it, it affected everybody. Um, and then what they had to do is convince people like middle class, a lot of middle class white people that it was in their own self interest to take note. Because they were like, okay, the only thing that's going to get all these fence sitters on board is if their self interest is at stake, and 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 that was easy, kind of, because it's like, oh, you thought your son was going to college? Uh, uh, he's going to Nam. So that that was that made it like that made it easier uh, in in a lot of respects. Uh, so it was that self interest, and yeah, just trying to mobilize that, but there was a lot of frustration uh, after a few years because they, they were um, blowing up CIA recruiters, like picketing in front of military recruitment stations. Um, clergymen were, were like standing outside of government buildings, like dumping blood on draft lists. Uh, there was a lot of stuff uh, going on. And, and there was a lot of stuff that happened during the protests uh, that people never talk about. Um, so a massive stage of dis civil disobedience happened still no movement um and then the third stage about halfway through the uh, war after veterans started going through one tour and then another tour and they started getting really messed up one out, one out of every six uh combat guys soldiers was addicted to heroin because you know they could get it um you know when they were on leave and you know denang or wherever uh they got like a, li a weekend pass uh and it got so bad that they started to kill their officers. It was called fragging. Like it's something that was totally covered up. Uh, so they'd frag officers that were like, oh yeah, but that ordered them into combat. Cause you know, when shit goes down, you know, grenades fly in random places, uh, bullets like wrap around trees and go through the branches and maybe they hit you in the back of the head. I don't know. So it's estimated that over 900 uh, of these combat leaders were uh, fragged during that time. And, that's that's something that you know people are like American troops would never do that. It's like I mean, it, it happened. It definitely happened. So okay, that's um, a word we just learned, y'all. Fragged, which is essentially like purposeful, friendly fire, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so it, it it comes from the term fragmentation grenade. So you just like chuck a grenade, and you know. Who can tell where the grenade came from? Could have come from the Viet Cong, right? So it's, yeah, fragging. Frag. Dance your cares away. Worries for another day. Let the music play. Down to yeah. frag. Yeah. Okay. So eventually, um, all of these movements weren't getting a lot of traction. But after, like, years and years, they started mobilizing politically. They started... Um, you know, creating lobbies because they realized that with all of this money, with all this corporatocracy that actually controlled American politics, because American politicians, there's a weak link for the system and that's politicians can be lobbied. So you know how there's APAC, right? Everyone's yeah. talking about APAC. They mm -hmm. are a special interest group that lobbies politicians. Well, there is so much anti-war sentiment during Vietnam that eventually they created anti-war lobbies that lobbied politicians and gave them campaign money. So it, it turned into a complete political front as well. So it started grassroots, then became slightly more organized, uh, sowed a bunch of confusion. Then the vets came in and they inflamed it more because we're like, they're like, hey, we're not winning this war. We're actually losing it and you're being lied to and it's pointless. Uh, also like, we're, we're killing our own dudes because fuck those guys. So, um, yeah, and there was just a, a, an insane amount of anger. And eventually that got uh, galvanized into po cohesive political action uh, in the past, in the last like few years. And they started lobbying politicians, just like other, like APAC lobbies politicians. Um, but it took a long time for that to happen. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, what do yeah. you think was over that time, like what? Like even in the call to us having to consider, like we need to get more sophisticated. 
what do you think, I mean, I guess in their, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the sophistication that they felt like they needed to get into their activism was they had to get into the halls of the, of the people that are making the decisions to keep this thing going. Like that was essentially what needed to happen. Yeah. I mean, you had to have access. Um, there, there were anti, there were businessmen, uh, who had in, anti-war interests. Um, okay. there, there were politicians who, whose constituents would, constituencies, no matter how much campaign money they had, would not vote them in unless they were anti-war. And that that's kind of what gave them the foot in. But um, when it comes to like what we can do right now, I mean, that, that's like a stretch goal at the moment. Uh, one of the big problems the backlash faced was that like these activists and like concerned people uh, that were anti-war were like five years in and then Finally, after five years, people were like, hey, Vietnam's bad. We should stop it. And, and at that point, they're just like, screw you, man. Like, where were you like five years ago? So there was some gatekeeping, which was actually damaging to the movement. Right. Because it's like, just bring them in. Like, yeah, we, the purity shit is not helpful. Yeah. Like, yeah. just bring them. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, OK, fine. We'll, we'll take you like, like fucking and nominate Patria Spirit and Saint <laughs> Let's get over there. You know, fucking. So, yeah. So, um, but one thing that's standing out to me, Stokes, mm -hmm. Stokes. Yeah, okay. send it. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that one of the very unique things here is that Vietnam was not, I mean, I guess Northern Vietnam was considered an ally through the proxy. No, South, Southern Vietnam was considered our like yeah. ally through the proxy. But, even in their ally status, they weren't as deep in connection with us by any means as Israel. So no, you can you can say that. Uh, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, the, the South Vietnamese government was a complete puppet, uh, unlike Israel, who seems to uh, control U.S. foreign policy to some measure. So it's a completely different scenario as well. So then, how do we? I mean, this is a big question, so I'm just throwing it at you, but mm -hmm. I understand if you're like, Amanda, mm -hmm. give me a fucking break. Um, <laughs> like, where does the intersect happen, right, between mm -hmm. the sophistication of the anti-war activism of Vietnam to where we are now? Because I feel like we are in a space where there's one, a lot more connectivity than there ever has been just by nature of Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. Like people can actually, like, I don't know you and yet I feel like I know you and that's because of Wi-Fi, right? Like mm -hmm. that's just right. that. And then there's also like more access to information. So it's a lot harder to keep people who are actually curious in the dark, right? Before, I mean, there was just a lot more, um, ease in keeping people silent but i mean now like you know just some good tiktoks will get you there so mm -hmm. what wh where does the intersection happen where we are now based on what you know of the anti-war activism of the viet of vietnam in terms of our next step in leveling up okay well first of all um uh our knowledge is incomplete and you're going to regret opening the star Wars door on this one. Cause I'm about to make an analogy. It's like, you're going to confront Vader and, and, and empire strikes back and you're not ready. Okay. So wait, just, uh, wait, 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 just so we're clear. Oh, can nice. You, can you see that? It, incidentally, the rebel Alliance was uh, structured uh, after the Viet Cong. So nor, her North name, Vietnamese. Her name is Jedi. Uh, okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, so uh, the knowledge is actually completely is, is incomplete. When I say when I talk about sophistication, mm -hmm. um, they understood imperialist systems better than we do. Uh, people are talking about Palestine and the other visible conflicts or conflicts that are visible to us in the West uh, as, as separate entities. They're, they're being like, oh, Palestine, Congo, Sudan, Ukraine. No, they're all part of the same system. Let me demonstrate. So conflict materials mined in Congo and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and adjoining countries like Angola, so on, are uh, somehow end up in the hands of Boeing and General Dynamics 
and Raytheon, defense contractors who file something called a specialized disclosure report with the Security and Exchange Commission. This report basically says we use conflict materials in our production processes. And no, we, because of third party sellers, we have no idea where they come from. They know that some of this, a, a significant portion of what they're getting is potentially and probably mined by enslaved children. Um, so those things that are the, like tungsten, coltan, uh, wolframite, like, like all these conflict materials go into the fancy JDAM guidance packages that they slap on the back of the bomb to make it a precision weapon. And those conflict materials mined in Congo are being dropped on Gaza. So that's just, uh, yeah, uh, that's just how gnarly so it's not it gets. Just, oh, this is fueling our phones or our electric cars. Mm -mm. Because uh, those those fancy guidance packages that are used in military technology, they require a lot of that stuff. The real, the real fancy stuff that you find in Central Africa. So they're connected. Um, the, the reason, and you know, Sudan's a whole thing. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but yes, there, there are definitely Israeli there's, and American. There's a Sudan uh, common sense kickback coming up shortly. Just yeah. so y'all know. <laughs> just so y'all know. Yeah, uh, that's definitely worth talking about. The same interests that are involved in Central uh, Africa uh, and Ukraine and Palestine are involved there as well. Because uh, mm -hmm. There's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it, Sudan's very mineral rich. We'll just say that. And it's in a strategically important position. Right. Uh, so it's, it's all connected. The reason Palestine is so important though, it kind of, I don't want to say it takes preeminence, but it's the one thing that we can put pressure on and use it as a lever to open up the other things. Yeah. Uh, Cause we have no leverage on Congo. Yeah. You, know? you like, no one's going to be out in the streets protesting for an end to the war in Ukraine. It's just not going to happen for a lot of cultural, like socio-cultural reasons. Um, uh, it's also a clearer through line of like mm -hmm. what's wrong. Yeah. Right. Like when, when people say what's going on in Palestine is complicated, like that's bullshit. But when people mm -hmm. say what's going on in the Congo is complicated, it actually is like, there's so many players that you have yes. to really like, and and everybody who's involved has like a different interest. Like it's not even like oh we're all here for the same reason. Yeah, and I'll say this about the Congo: it's also more complicated because we have less control over. Because it's not just Western imperialism; it's also Chinese imperialism, it's Russian imperialism. Russia, Russian mercenaries are all over Africa, doing doing the dirty the dirty shit. So we have less control over that right now. Uh, but Palestine is the simplest. It's the one we can directly put pressure on at the moment. And if, and if, if you gain ground there, you can gain ground elsewhere. Uh, so as I said, it's, it's, it's the lever, but when it comes to becoming more sophisticated, it's, it's recognizing this as a system, which is, uh, as a power structure. Right. And, um, because people tend to hyper fixate on things that I don't think are helpful. Uh, one example of this is the defense industrial complex. People are like, oh, they're sending more bombs uh, just so you know, Raytheon and Boeing can make more money. It's like, not really. Uh, those bombs are already paid for. They're already built. Um, it, that's not where the real money is. The real money is actually coming from weapons testing in Gaza because like drones are something that are being actively tested, surveillance equipment in West Bank, stuff that will eventually be used on Americans, okay? So, like, we can talk about bombs dropped in another country all we want, but when, if you want to activate someone's self-interest, all that security equipment uh, that's being tested in West Bank, all those, like, automated, riot-controlled, dystopian, sci-fi, you know, auto-targeting gun, auto -targeting guns, yeah, they're 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 gonna be uh they're gonna be totally trying those out in Cop City in Atlanta and all the other cop cities that are built around the country, mostly uh in response to the BLM movement and how out of control things the police thought that got. So uh yeah, if you don't think this isn't coming home to any any of what you're smoking, because it's way too uh intense for me. I mean, they broke ground on a cop city in Tennessee. 
Mm -hmm. And they have, they did put plans together for a cop city in Baltimore, um, which I heard from the Baltimore mayor when I interviewed him that, you know, it's just, it ain't got nothing to do with it, with, with what's already there. Like that was just an independent. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, do I sound conspiracy? So, okay. No, I'll tell you why, but uh, say that and I'll tell you why you're not. <laughs> what do you think I'm going to say? No, no, no I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> and I can, I can, whatever it is, it's not, I can prove it. So, so go ahead. Do you think there's any legitimacy to the possibility of Israel using that stuff on us? I mean, uh, they probably already, I mean, they, we already like know they for their own they, they, Like for their own game. Like, I feel like what I'm watching is Netanyahu, like very loudly pull his dick out and be mm -hmm. like, yeah, 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 Biden. I'll like knock your wobbly ass over with my Israel dick. And why Biden just keeps being like, and I'm like, yes, sir. Can I please food? have some more? <laughs> please, some more food, sir. Food, glorious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tech, glorious tech. Like, I'm just like, where are the, I feel like Netanyahu literally like waited for a simp like Biden to come into the mix so that he could run shit. Because if you see Netanyahu when he would sit with other folks, with other presidents, they'd be like, we running this, not you. Biden's like, can we be can we be friends? I want to be is I want to be Zionist. So I'm just wondering if there's any if there's any like reverse imperialism that can come out of this because I think America thinks that they're running shit and they're actually getting run. See, uh, okay, so it, it's I, I think trying to separate it like they're two separate entities in this regard is uh, is incorrect. I think they form like a symbiotic relationship you know um they're so enmeshed at this point when like the symbiosis ends up being like okay so as somebody who has um dated men who think they're smarter than me right like mm -hmm. it starts with them being like look like we're we're on the same plane you know we're of the same mind i'm helping you you're helping me we're teaching each other but then at some mm -hmm. point they start to feel like you're like, you're trying to swell up on me and I'm, I'm me though. I'm me. And so then the symbiosis starts to erode because they then feel like, nah, I got to show you who the real boss is. And they want to have, they want to run the show. And I just wonder if there's like an end to that symbiosis. I don't feel like that symbiosis is, is, uh, infinitus. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it will certainly take time to dismantle, but, um, yeah, Israel as a political entity is rebelling against being told no because it's yeah. a spoiled child. Uh, so it's it's flailing, uh, it's making mis it's making mistakes and throwing tantrums. But the symbiosis is that. Let me explain. Our policies, our border policies, for instance, require mm -hmm. Israeli technology. Elbit Systems, which everybody should learn the name of, there's surveillance equipment all across the Rio Grande. Their drones used by border patrol like so and then we sell them our own equipment they sell us surveillance and spy stuff and drone stuff we sell them drone stuff we sell them bombs so it's it's this the defense industrial complex of both countries are completely enmeshed and the same people that are making money off sales from israel to america are making money off sales from america to israel so it's very much a corporatocracy. So when people hyperfixate on uh, on foreign lobbies like APEC, like APEC controls our elections. I mean, no, they're just one special interest group that controls our elections. Um, you see, the reason politicians really don't know how to deal with this situation is because they have multiple paymasters. All right. They, they have. Yes, they have special interest lobbies like APEC, but they also have uh, special interest lobbies from Boeing and Raytheon, like the defense industrial complex. They also have special interests that they try to serve from uh, 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 capital management and asset uh, companies like BlackRock, like Vanguard, the controllers of global capital who manage different, uh, who manage portfolios from the entire economic and industrial sector, from defense to energy, to pharma, to tech. And they have diversified port uh, portfolios. Now, 
the politicians also have to appeal to voters because voters expect to be told certain things and they expect certain behavior from their politicians. And that's why everyone's like running along, running with their head cut off, like doubling down on Israel uh, because that's what they've always done. That's what they've been taught to do. And it's not the smart move. They're just falling back on old behavior because they don't know how to adjust to a changing system. Right. Um, so there's actually something democratic at play when it comes to uh, escalating uh, to a regional conflict in Israel uh, and the Middle East because of these capital management, uh, these asset management firms, these like global BlackRock, Vanguard things, they're not just responsible to Boeing and Raytheon in the defense industrial sector. Uh, they have business interests in every economic sector. So yes. what's good for Boeing may be bad for the energy sector. Causing a regional war in the Middle East is not good for Halliburton or, or like, you know, exactly. British Petroleum or anything like that. So what you're seeing right now is a private, a big private sector push mm -hmm. for st stability. The smart money is on de-escalation. So that's why... But uh, hasn't South historically it always been like, oh, war makes people money? No. Uh, oh, but that's. Do you, the, do you the, agree that that's been like the messaging? Like that, like I feel like that's what I've always heard. Like that's why we go to war because war it makes people money. Like Dick Cheney went, <laughs> like Cheney wanted uh, Bush to go to war so that he could get money through Halliburton. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The, the main lie, the main propaganda lie, is that war makes the average person money. It doesn't. It makes the top point one percent money. Okay. Yeah, that that's that's the the propaganda that war stimulates economies. No, it's yeah. it stimulates certain sectors of an economy that the corporatocracy, the top one point one percent, have vested interests in, and that's who we call war profiteers. So, right. um, yeah, the smart money's on de-escalation because there. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this or, or like heard people talking about how a lot of the Gulf states especially are complicit in the Western imperialist system. So they actually actively still, despite the genocide in Palestine, really want the Israel to stop so they can have a normalization deal with Israel. Because what everybody wants right now, all of these private sector global interests want is a trade corridor from Mumbai in Southern India into uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai Put it like putting the goods on trains through Saudi Arabia and Jordan, shipping them, shipping the goods from Haifa into Europe. And that is going to make everybody so rich. And you know what's not going to make everybody so rich? A freaking regional conflict. So there's a lot of there's a lot pushing for a, a de-escalation. And the fact that Netanyahu's like, no, it is pissing a lot of people off, not just politicians. So I. Personally, I and a lot of other people don't think he's that long for uh, this world. So we'll see. But when I talk about sophistication, that's that's kind of what they understood more than we do. Because there, there's been a lot of propaganda that we've been fed because we come from a different generation that they didn't grow up with. Uh, it was just at the beginning. The Cold War had only been going on for like 20 years you know, there were still a lot of people that were like socialism, like let's let's try communism. You know, they they, they didn't grow up with this uh, propaganda democracy, like democracy, democracy, right? Well, I mean, yeah, what democracy? Right? Democracy, but, democracy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> democracy. Well, well, more it's more like capitalism, capitalism. Cap like, look at what the communists did. Look at them. I mean, yeah, Stalin killed millions of his own people, and so did Mao Zedong. But like, cap. But so say did that cap you know, like yeah. Uh, so, like we we overthrew governments in most of the South and Central America. So we supported death squads in Guatemala, Contras, and Nicaragua. You know, all these horrible things. Uh, intentionally destabilized Africa. You know, for our own like corporate purposes. So yeah, I mean, like if he who was out, he was out who he was at, without sin cast the first stone. But yeah, we grew up with all this propaganda. Uh, but it, during the Vietnam War, people questioned it more. Uh, you know, these were still 
new things. The defense industrial complex was still a new thing. Uh, yeah. They didn't have all this entrenched propaganda around it about national security, about energy security in the Middle East. We must secure the oil or American society will crumble into anarchy because people can't get anywhere without gas. You know, just stuff that, you know, didn't yeah. really exist in the same way that it does now. Um, so well, we've become people, so comfortable in our yeah. convenience, you know, mm -hmm. that that's what they're playing against us. Right. It's that we just just keep everybody chill, man. Like you guys have it so good. Like everybody just stay chill. I mean, I, I feel like part of the sophistication that you're talking about is understanding the same way that the grassroots movement of the Vietnam of the anti-Vietnam war understood that the special interests of the middle class per se was like, your children will go to war. So yeah. We got to get to that at this point, since there is no draft, it's almost as if right now the special interest is of the corporations who are having their fucking money possibly blocked by this, uh, ex by this continued siege. Would you say that's accurate? Well, I think people's special interest is like, you know, a lot, a lot of people who are going to be complacent about this aren't worried about cops. Cause like they don't, best with me i'm a lot you know because of reasons but um the, the biggest thing is people realize that they're getting totally screwed you know we're looking I mean, at like, israel in, in the way uh, that israel has it, like the things that we don't have yeah uh we we just watched 14.7 billion go to israel just from like military equipment and a lot of that aid wasn't even for bombs or guns a lot of that aid was financial stimulus because they took 300,000 people out of the workforce so they can go like make tiktok videos in uniform a lot of this is payroll by the way a lot of our aid is paying israeli soldiers because that's one of the biggest expenses of war so just just so you guys know you're paying their salaries you're not even paying for bombs those bombs are already paid for we fight people fight off stockpiles pre-existing stockpiles so um but now Biden's floating the idea of relieving $1.2 billion of student debt. Like, oh, good, dude. So you're telling me you could have just wiped it all out, you know, and, and Gaza didn't have to get carpet bombed. So the, people are starting to realize that, especially Gen Z is starting to realize like, well, can't really ever buy a house. You know, wonder why. But like we can send $60 billion to Ukraine, which is a war that is probably already lost. Uh, so yeah, it, it's just, it's just absurd. The special interest is that I think is that you're just getting screwed on so many fronts. You're getting screwed on healthcare. You're getting screwed on housing. You're getting screwed on student school. debt a school. Yeah. I mean, well, they're, they're, they're cutting, you know, education funding. They, they've been slowly assaulting and whittling it, whittling it down. So you're just dumb, uh, you know, just, just, you know, look at your TikTok and make dance videos and, and listen to Taylor Swift um, and, you know, just fall asleep. Can a asleep. day go by? Can a yeah. day go by where I don't yeah. have this game? I know. It's, yeah. So um, I think that's self-interest. But it, it, I'm still figuring out how to, like, get more people involved in that because – yeah, that, that's that's the big that's the big disconnect that I'm still trying to figure out. Well, let's talk like, about it. How, how what well, is look, the big, the big know, disconnect you're trying to figure out is how to get more people involved specifically in what? Like this this um divestment, like like BDS shit, like not just for Palestine, but like all this problematic stuff. Uh because the only thing that really changes anything that we can really do, because like yeah, you know, we can vote for Republicans, which is far right, or we can vote for Democrat, which is also a right leaning party. Um, mm -hmm. And there's no difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to foreign policy. You know, they quibble, you know, they fight over like drag queens reading to kids, but they still pass the same war packages, the same war money for like our allies overseas. So the, the theory of a uniparty system when it comes to foreign policy is something I personally believe in. But um, how do we get more, more people involved? Well, that's a tough one because like, yeah, I, I know, I know my people and, and you know, 
it's it's uh, it's going to take some time. You know, people expect people are looking at Gaza and being like, we're we're five months in. How are you still not on board? But because we're so involved in it, we don't realize that most people, you know, they paid attention for the first week and now they're like back going to shows and like checking, you know, my zodiac, whatever those those types of people. Yeah. I don't even know anymore. So that, that's I mean, that's what the majority of the country have, is doing. If you don't have like a connective tissue to it, you can go through life without knowing about any of this going on. I mean, that's really yeah. the nature of our media system, right? Like they just decide mm -hmm. when things matter, when things don't. I mean, I'm in the middle of reading consenting, I mean, manufacturing consent, and my mind is blown every day um, by <laughs> just the realization that our media is censorship just on a mindfuck level because we've been thinking like they'll tell you like oh no we have free it's free media like we we have free press and in other places they don't and it's like well no yet yeah, no they don't but we don't either because our press is controlled and when you break out of that space they shut you down so that is not the same thing it's it's actually as it's actually a very effective form of censorship because it makes everybody feel like we have freedom when it's really like you're being fed a bunch of crap. But I feel like there's um, a silence that has happened around Pakistan, I mean, around Palestine for people who are not necessarily tapped in. I mean, you're not hearing about Palestine on your nightly news. I mean, even me no. doing radio, I do radio every day. I have to actively insert it into my show. And to the chagrin of <laughs> the advertisers, but some people, yeah, yeah, but like I have to do it. And some days it may be a whole story, but some days it has to just be, you know, me making my little quips and the people who are listening. I mean, I've had people say like, you talk about Palestine every day. Yes. And, and I will <laughs> because y'all need yeah, to understand. I mean, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it, it lays it lies at the intersection of so many of our problems. Um, you know, it, it's it's a manifestation of a level of imperialism uh, and violent colonialism that you know. Again, I studied in college. And I was like, oh, that was back in the eighteen hundreds. You know, no, it, I, I, I'm I'm as actually shocked. I'm completely shocked. I knew the response was going to be bad because I. Uh, I had access to certain information in the military about like the 2006 Lebanon war, like U S military knows they got their ass kicked when the IDF went into Lebanon, they got, their, they got spanked big time by Hezbollah. Um, and I also know that they had a brutal apartheid regime and that their counterinsurgency tactics were not effective because we send them U S advisors and the U S advisors look at what they're doing in West bank and Gaza and be like, all right, well, you just got a whole new round of a uh, new whole new generation of insurgents that you're not going to get rid of. So I already had a pretty dim view of the Israeli military. Uh, but the fact that we uh, support them so blindly just show, really goes to show you takes the mask off of all the propaganda that we've been fed in the post 9-11 world and, and the, the Cold War propaganda that we were fed to by our parents and kind of makes you question the whole system, especially it, and I think when, if we're going to circle back to the whole like activism thing, one thing that uh, Vietnam was, the Vietnam activists were good at was integrating multiple fronts. As I said, they had like the civil rights, they had uh, the anti-war vets, they had like the, the love child hippies who were basically, their only purpose was to do ridiculous stunts to manipulate the media, but like, fine, let them you know, do their thing over there. Um, <laughs> it, you know, uh, and I think communication between like, not just movements within the United States, but also movements within other countries. I was just talking to some, uh, like an Indian activist and she, she was like, well, we can learn from each other. Cause like what doesn't work in India might work there. And what doesn't work in the United States might work there. So we, we have, we have the, ability to easily communicate globally. And yeah. th these are all connected because what's happening in India uh, s since 
uh, October 7th, the amount of Islamophobia in India has skyrocketed. Like the BJP. It was already uh, bonkers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I moved back from India like a year and a half ago, and it's already gotten so much worse. So, um, what the fuck were you doing in India? Oh my God. It's a whole freaking story. It's like, I was going through some shit. I was like, I'll go to India and like, we're like <laughs> right for a nonprofit. <laughs> I mean, I was supposed to be, I was supposed to be writing a book, but I just ended up going out every night in, in Goa for like way too long. So, but you know, it's a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. I'm still alive. I made it. Um, so yeah, it's already so much worse. Uh, and it's, it's just being in, in what we're able to, to realize is that this rise in global national fascism is a phenomenon. It's just happening right now. It's like, yes. it's like everywhere and it's getting worse. Um, yes. and so, I mean, if you look at, and it's in places that I think people aren't even paying attention to like Argentina just got their own Trump. Um, the Netherlands mm -hmm. who was just by the way, in Israel, like crying, yeah. running out, and she's like, "You're you're not Jewish." Um, the Netherlands has their own version of Trump, you know, like they're all and they all have the same like like comb over hair. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of bizarre. Um, but then you have like the woman who's running shit in Italy, and she's definitely down with the fascism. And I think what you're saying though is an answer to the question that you were asking. One of the biggest differences is like you said, okay, so one of the things you said was one of the effective ways that the Vietnam anti-war activists were, were um, one of the ways that they were effective was in connecting movements. And mm -hmm. one of the ways that we have, one of the things that we have that they didn't have is an able, a way to be globally connected without phone cards mm -hmm. <laughs> and without yeah. long distance, which is a real thing. Some of y'all are too young to understand long distance, but long distance was a real thing. And it was like, I can't call you. I don't have long distance. <laughs> like I just don't have it. Whereas now you can WhatsApp and you can, you know, we used to Skype and all that. So like the connectivity is global. And I really honestly feel like one of the things that America has been very effective at doing is making Americans feel like they don't have a global connection. I mean, there's a real myopia that has been put upon us that, really makes us have not only American exceptionalism, but American blinders. And we like really are, a lot of us are like from other places, but a lot of Americans are really only thinking about America. And your point is that there's a lot more support here outside of here. Yeah, not not only that, but you can learn from it and you can learn from each other. Uh, a, a lot of people like, a lot of people were surprised by Germany's reaction um in their stance on the israel palestine stuff uh like how hardcore they were because they're like watching a genocide and stuff but i'm just like no it's it's not even about feeling bad about the holocaust my grandmother was german she had a lot of problematic ideas and if you think denazification ever happened no it's it's not even about like persecuting a group it, it's more about like you listen to the government all right you listen so like all like like all <laughs> And a big problem with global fa the rise of global fascism is that we're, you we're throwing the word terrorist around like a cudgel, right? It's like, we don't like someone, they're fucking with our money, terrorist. And a lot of it's a lie because we have diplomatic and special envoys to both the Houthis. The U.S. State Department has special envoys to both the Houthis and Hezbollah. We have diplomatic relations and we talk like every day. Uh, that, but we still call them a terrorist, you know. So it's just, <laughs> yeah, you know. Okay. Uh, so it's all it's it's all just theater bullshit. But what the the problem is with this rise of like fascism? You, you listen to the state. We, we're building cop cities everywhere, and we're throwing around the term terrorist. It's like, well, that can easily be applied domestically to an enemy of the state, you know? So I think we're at a lot more dangerous time than people really think. I think, um, you, you know, uh, complacency really needs to be over because it's it's only really getting worse. Um, I and my biggest fear, Greg, is that it is a necessary step that it get worse. Oh, yeah. 
hundred percent complacent. Like that's like, I mean, it doesn't matter that we are seeing it ahead of time. Some people really are in your grandma's shoes where they really trust the government and that the government is always going to like look out for the people, even though it never has. Um, it looks out for its own people. Like that's essentially what it is. And I feel like a lot of folks don't really understand. So when you talk about like, we need to learn about imperialism, she, people don't even understand Americanism. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, that the concept of even how this place functions and the system of um dis and, and the system of dysfunction below a certain group. I mean, it's functional for only a very for like the people who can go to Bohemian Grove. Like they're having a great time. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Um so I guess my takeaway is what are the ways? Okay, well, one. One of the biggest things that you said is that the Vietnam War, like this was a 10 year. 10 years, 10 years. And there are, listen, we're, we're a lot of us who just got to this. Like, I, I mean, I, I would say that my activism around Palestine started in 2021, but a lot of people like just got here. And I mean, 2021 feels like just got here. So there are mm -hmm. efforts that have been being made before then, right? So I don't feel like we're just starting at the five month peri period. I think that globally though, right. this is the groundswell, right? Like we're seeing a, yeah. a groundswell that we haven't seen before. Um, mm -hmm. But that being said, I think one of the ways that a lot of people when we look, when we started this conversation around like how the, how the fuck do we step up? One of the most basic, basic, basic ways is understanding that you have to be educated in order to truly be a part of this in a long-term effort mm -hmm. because there really is no way to truly be like in this if you think it just starts at Palestine. Right. Um, and if it just starts at Palestine, it's not sustainable because one of the big problems that happened after Vietnam is that people are like, OK, a lot, a lot of people, some like a, a lot of people, a lot of the middle class people who the draft was over, the war was over. They're like, OK, Vietnam's done. My work's over. And what happened was Hollywood put about out a bunch of like celebratory Vietnam movies uh, portraying an image of American victory. You had like Sylvester Stallone, like John Rambo, fucking they drew first blood, you know. Um, Platoon, Full Metal yeah. Jacket, uh, Good Morning Vietnam. I mean, that wasn't like celebratory, but uh, I mean, Lieutenant Dan yeah. lost his legs. Yeah. But even 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 Forrest Gump was kind of celebratory because out of that he, he became like a fishing magnate. You know, it's just I mean, it's a good story, obviously, but, you know, there's some problematic elements to it. And, you know, they they said that we were fighting against communism. It's like, OK, sure. And that that gives them carte blanche to do everything. So there was a lot of revisionist propaganda. And one of the things they did, um, one of the things the mass media did in retrospect to the Vietnam War, is they said all of these protests were like dirty hippies. And yes. that's not true at all. Like, mm -hmm. so so everyone has this idea that it was like dirty hippies, you know, just like flower children, like LSD, Grateful mm -hmm. Dead Man, just like get in touch with your freaking third eye. I, you know, just really Dropping basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just, just being like lazy, you know, dragging society down type people. Um, so, yeah. And honestly, they had, I just want to mention this one point. Um, there's a lot of uh, what we're seeing, you know, with the, the accusation of anti-Semitism. Uh, there was the same accusa accusation of communism from a whole block of like dumbass counter protesters that were like, I have pictures that are carrying signs and saying like, long hair is communist. You're like long <laughs> hair is communism. So, so this dumbass fascism that we're seeing right now has always existed, and it's not going away. It, it just looks differently now. So, um, all yeah. right. I yeah, don't. I'm so, sorry. I just have the theme, I have the theme song from Mash in my head. So. Yeah. 
So while you no, give us a so, statement, I will give you theme music. Go ahead. Okay. So what you have to realize, uh, this is a long, complicated topic. But for now, no gatekeeping. So in like five months, this is still going to be going on. So you can't like X people out just because they're just decided to unscrew themselves and get on the right side of things. Second, learn more about imperialism, about how it's all connected. And then once Palestine's over, it's going to have to be something else. Because what the Vietnam War did, the protesters, was normalize opposition so they knew it wasn't going away so traffic was going to keep being blocked and and it will keep being blocked for another 10 years so that's a good starting point i would say there you go i hope you were listening y'all i know a lot of folks feel like it's so much bigger than me how can i do this and it is and it's always been and we are continuing like we're not starting from scratch, we're continuing. And we took a little break. I feel like there was, I mean, the nineties was a time. It was, a t I know a lot of us, yeah. <laughs> like a lot of us who grew up in the nineties were just like, this is great. Um, and now, you know, my generation, we're the older people now and there's responsibilities. And I feel like a lot of times people can get again, overwhelmed with this idea of like, we're starting from scratch. We've never been starting from scratch. I, I feel like I've been here before and I like come back periodically just to see that the shit is continuing. Like that's really how I feel. And I low key feel like I came from the future and I'm back. And like, I keep trying to tell y'all, I done seen it. It's hap It's going to happen. And y'all are like, no, it's fine. Yeah. Let's watch no, it. Nobody, no. Yeah. Nobody listens to John Connor though. <sighs> <laughs> and you know yeah. what? Like you said, the more things change, things change. The, more the same. Stoker, where can people connect with you more? Where can they check out this new podcast that you fashioned? All that good uh, stuff. Oh yeah, we're 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 doing an exciting episode on how vulnerable military assets are and U.S. military assets are in the Middle East tomorrow at Colonial Outcast podcast we just launched this week uh and then i'm on instagram at greg.j.stoker um what was the name of the podcast oh, where there, can they there's get the podcast? they can just like anywhere and... oh it's on it's on youtube it's on youtube ah so it's called it Col colonial space outcasts colonial space outcasts plus colonial Outcasts pod. Um, all right. I'm getting pretty nice with this shit, by the way. Y'all see me? I'm getting nice with these banners and whatnot. Like, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> wow, that um, is fancy. <laughs> I started doing this like maybe two, three weeks ago. And now I feel like I'm like in here running the boards, running the boards. Well, Stoker, yeah. I must say, I really appreciate just your willingness to come on here and talk and share. And I consistently learn from the content that you are putting out there. And it's a new era of educator. You know, the, that's where we are. Like, it's not just people in a classroom anymore. And it's not just mm -hmm. in books, but write the fucking book. Um, <laughs> yeah. And... Yeah. Whoa. And uh, I will be in Texas at some point and I will hit you up. And yeah, um, absolutely. Well, people, thanks, for thanks for having me on. It's great. It's great. You're the best. And everybody, make sure to follow, if you haven't already, follow Soaker and check out the uh, Colonial Outcast pod on YouTube. Thanks, All right. guys. All right, y'all. That was fun. And uh, make sure to check out uh, my Patreon. Go to Patreon. Go to the Seal Squad um, and join us. Uh, this content, I'm going to cut some clips and you'll be able to uh, watch this later. So if you have friends who missed this, they'll be able to access this on YouTube. And again, make sure to check out Greg J. Stoker on Instagram and Colonial Outcast Pod on YouTube. And I will be in San Diego tomorrow night doing stand up. If y'all don't buy tickets to the second 10 o'clock to the 10 o'clock show, I'm just not going to do it. And I don't know if you think I'm bullshitting, but I'm dead serious. I'll just not do the show. So 
we first two first 7 30 show on friday 7 30 show saturday Mwah. love you perfect but if y'all don't get it together for those 10 o'clock shows i'm not gonna do it now y'all can buy the tickets but if i don't sell at least 100 tickets for those shows i'm just not gonna do them um and if, even if you don't if you even if you can't come but you just buy the ticket that'll be great too uh but thank you all for your supers i appreciate y'all who got supers during this conversations remember like these are we're just like giving our time. So I appreciate all of you and I wish you all a great night. Remember, we are each other's business. When we look out for each other, we lift each other up. Please make sure to listen to my syndicated radio show, The Amanda Seal Show. You can check it out wherever you get your podcasts and you can also uh, check it out in select cities. All right. So I, I consider these this space, the Common Sense Kickback, to be an extension of The Amanda Seal Show where I have five minute conversations about shit that needs to be at least an hour. So y'all heard your marching orders from Stoker. Get busy. We got work to do. All right, we're done. Oh. All right. Awesome. Well,